and I say good morning to everybody on this bright and wonderful Monday morning where everything seems to want to go kind of sideways for me, but here we are. I uh, guess I created myself some problems. I was trying to get real fancy with my workstation and clean the area up, so I got, uh, I was trying to set up a docking station for the computer and everything went uh, kind of haywire and when I got up this morning so I had to unscrew everything again, put it all back together and uh, rush to get everything and then my mouse decided only part of it wanted to work this morning, my trackpad. So welcome to my world, but it is Monday and God is still on his throne no matter what comes my way. So good morning, Miss Carolyn. It's good to see you. First thing this morning with Cynthia. And Dale and Ryan, there's Buddy and Julia. God bless. Happy Monday to you too, Buddy. Uh, there's Miss Donna. Good morning to you. And there is Miss Sue. Good morning to you as well. And we will continue onward and upward in our quest to uh, work our way through this incredible book, the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ to John the above, beloved apostle. All right, we've been looking last, we took up our attention here, really, in this chapter 11, which we will probably come very close to wrapping up today, because uh, we've been looking at the two witnesses, identity, character, conduct, martyrdom, uh, the resurrection, uh, the ascension, uh, then you have the, uh, uh, the great earthquake that takes place, and then we move into the declaration of the uh, uh, seventh trumpet or the third woe. After the resurrection ascension, there's a great earthquake and there are 7,000 that are killed. Uh, perhaps some are saved through this, but the majority of course will just simply confess the glory and power of God without any repentance or faith whatsoever. Uh, much like the fallen angels who uh, James said believes uh, and tremble but of course they uh, are in a confirmed state of rebellion against God. Uh, because of the hardness of their hearts, uh, these will have become confirmed in the, their unrepentant condition. They have reached, for those who stand in that position, they have reached a point of no return. Uh, now this ends, really, our interlude and leads us out of the interlude with the announcement of the seventh trumpet or the third woe. And Sherry has come in and said what a great time to be alive as we see the return of our Savior approaching near. And I love you too, my dear, and that's right. Miss Terry says, please lift up my sister Sandy. Dad is really giving her a difficult time. Every day it's something different. Love you all. Had a conversation with Terry yesterday. She and Sherry were uh, about what's been going on. Folks, really, really pray for Sandy and pray for Terry's dad. Terry will be going down, I think she said the 17th uh, of this month for the Christmas. She's going to stay there a month, help give her sister kind of a break uh, and a breather as well. So let's go ahead and invite uh, God to lead us through uh, this section as we come to the closing words in Revelation and chapter 11. All right, Father, we thank you so much. We, we, we just lift our hearts up to you. We understand what you tell us about loving you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all our mind, all our strength. We understand, Lord, that that's the highest calling that we can have in this world. And to be so absolutely in love with you that everything else pales in comparison. And Lord, we do come and we pray, Lord, that we can put all of the pressures that all of the, the, the heartaches and all the worries and problems that we have in our world that each one of us carry that Lord for these moments we have put them aside and our focus and attention just comes squarely upon you and your word as you lead us guide us open up to us uh, the words of wisdom words of uh, instruction correct us where we need to be Lord reproof us if necessary train us where we so desperately need more equipping. God, that's what your word is there for, to prepare our hearts so that we are, we, we have everything necessary, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Lord, 
I look out here just with the folks that have plugged in this morning and know uh, that so many are carrying so many burdens. Uh, burdens as they are concerned about children and uh, burdens as that comes with health difficulties. Burdens as it comes from caring for others. But Lord, I know Terry is not only worried about her dad, but deeply worried for her sister who carries the burden of the day-to-day -day care of her dad. Father, I pray that uh, you might just intervene in that situation. I know these these diseases, these, these problems come with age for many when it comes to memory breakdown. And, uh, Lord, I saw it with my mom. And I know the pain that that can carry. So I lift Terry up, I lift Sandy up, and Lord, I lift her dad up. That you might calm his confused mind in these hours. Lord, I ask you to take us into your word this morning and open up to us the treasures that exist there and give each of us the wisdom that we need to take the gems that are there and apply them to our life to the reality of, of, of where we are in our day. Now we praise you. We thank you for this Monday. We look forward, Lord, to where you're leading us. I pray, Lord, as we pray for international missions this week. Uh, Lord, I was going to do something in that area today and uh, just with the problems that I had with the computer today, Lord, I didn't get it put together and ready to go. But Lord, everybody, if they've got their, their guides, let them pray for those missionaries today that are out there before us. Now, Lord, I, I lay the difficulties that I have because it's important to me it, it, it's that, that this system runs correctly and properly so that we can do not just an adequate job, Lord, but a job worthy of our King as we come together day by day in this medium to study your word. So Lord, I just put it all in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. It's important to me that what we do here, we do to the very best of our ability, that we do it the best that we can. And that means that, that I want things to be right. I was going to share the the story of the missionary today as we launched it because this is our week of prayer for Lottie Moon for international missions so uh, I pray that you'll take time to uh, look at that guide if you've got one if not if you'll get a hold of me and let me know you'd like something I'll, I'll send it to you if you don't have something uh, and make sure that you get a guide I think I've got one out here that I can put in PDF format and just you know send it off to you so let me know and I can do that uh, you know, this is an important time that we come together to be able to uh, to do these things that are so vitally important in the kingdom. And this whole uh, international mission opportunity that we have, reaching our world for Christ while we still have a chance, that's really what international missions is all about. Well, let's go ahead and look at the seventh trumpet, which really comprises, comprises the, the third woe. Uh, let's look at those scriptures again. Uh, we just read through them Friday as we closed. It says, uh, starting in verse 14, it says, The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the second angel sounded, and there was a loud voice in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit, around, uh, sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces in worship of God. Verse 17, saying, We give thanks to you, O Lord, the Almighty, who are and, 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 and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and, they, and, and your wrath came, and the time came for, for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants and prophets and servants and saints and those who fear your name, small and great, to destroy those who destroy the earth. Verse 19, we go. 
uh, the temple of uh, God, which is in heaven, was opened. The Ark of the Covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds of, and peals of thunder and, and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. Now, verse 14 opens up with an announcement of the third woe. In other words, the parenthetical th section that we've been looking at that started the first verse of chapter 10 and run all the way to the 11th chapter and verse 13 uh, illuminated some of the details of the tribulation. Such things as we looked at uh, last week as the angel of the little book, the measuring of the temple, the activity of the two witnesses during the last three and a half year period. Now this interlude is now completed. And verse 14, we have an announcement that the second woe is past. Literally it means it, it's come. The idea is it's come and it's gone. We're through the second woe now. And here John again resumes the sequential movement of the book. So the second woe included uh, in chapter 9 is now mentioned as the introduction to the third or final woe. So John says, behold, the third woe is coming quickly. In chapter 8, verse 13, John was informed that the last three trumpet judgments would be called woes, koi, if you remember the word, would, and they would be more intense uh, uh, in, in you know, they're just going to build in their intensity toward those earth dwellers. In other words, those who who uh, who are at home in the earth. In other words, those who have rejected the grace of God. Now, in chapter four, in chapter eleven, verse fourteen, we're told that the third woe is coming, and it's coming quickly. This is the seventh trumpet that will take up take us up to the return of Christ and the establishment of His kingdom. Now, the picture given in verses 15 through 19 that we just read is uh, a panoramic of the rest of the tribulation. It, it's like taking the entire scene from the perspective of a helicopter where you can see where you are at the end of the second woe and where you're going to be at the end of the third woe. All right? This is one of these confusing sections, I think, when you read Revelation. I mean, here you've been you've been reading these woes. You, you've now looked at what what uh, the three and a half year ministry of the two half witness uh, the the two uh, witnesses of God is in those last three and a half years. We've looked at that, and then all of a sudden we have this explosion in in heaven that uh, has an exalted Christ sitting upon his throne, and the kingdom of God is coming. And that's the end of the you know that comes we know at the very end of the seven-year tribulation, the very end of that period of time. Uh, so people say, now what happens? Because here in chapter 12, we get into what, and then chapter 13, we get into the activity of the unholy trinity of the, uh, the beast and the antichrist and the false prophet. So what's going on here? Well, this is one of those helicopter rides that take you up you know, and where you can see for a long distance, see the whole thing, you know, played out. Now we're looking at the very end, you know, in this sequential pattern of things, all right? We're going to come back in quickly uh, to another parenthetical section before we settle down into, you know, the final stretch of the, uh, the, the sequential uh, parts of the book. But these are giving us an understanding of, of what is. I, I think what encourages me when I read Revelation, like I said, you get into some very dark things, uh, very you know, soul-wrenching things, and then God brings you out and puts your eyes upon him so that we aren't just focused on this Bible, but we're looking at the end of the picture. We're looking at the glory of God. Uh, the stress, the stress is on the effects of the seventh trumpet in verses 15 through 19, which usher in the reign of Christ. And that's what, what verses 15 and 17 is all about. Take a look at those again. Open your Bible and take a look at them. Uh, if my mouse will work a little bit longer and we can get a little more click in, we'll, we'll have it up there for you. And then the seventh angel sounded. And there was a loud voice in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat upon their throne before God fell on their faces and worship, saying, We give thanks, O Lord, to the Almighty, who are, isn't that interesting, who are, who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. 
This judgment becomes the greatest woe because it includes the seven bowls of judgment, though they're not mentioned here. Chapters 12 through 14 form the third parenthetical section filling in more details uh, of other key events and personages. Chapter 13 is one of the longest chapters, and we'll be spending a lot of time in there when we get, you know, when we get to it, because it is the unfolding and the work of that unholy trinity. Once the seventh trumpet is blown, its judgments will come like a, uh, like a trip hammer, just you blow, you know, one quick succession after another, and the end is then very near. Uh, the announcement that we have of, of Christ's reign is found in verse 17 when it talks about the seventh angel sounded. The seventh and final trumpet is blown and immediately something happens in heaven. There's an immediate heavenly response when that seventh trumpet is blown. And there rose, it says, a loud voice in heaven. The contrast, in, in, in contrast to 10, 8, chapter 10, verse 8, and chapter 11, verse 1, where a single voice is heard, now we have a great choir in heaven is heard praising God for what is about to occur. Note that their voices are loud. This stresses the joy and extreme exuberance over what God is going to do through the seventh trumpet. We ought to be excited because now at the end of this horrific time, the kingdom of God is going to be established on earth, and God's will will be done here just like it is in heaven. He says the kingdom of this world. Kingdom is singular there. It refers to the reign and rule of the entire earth that God intended to be under man's authority and rule, but was wrestled from man by Satan. Satan became the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working, or the ruling king and the sons of disobedience. There are only two kingdoms, people. Now, we can look at the nations of the earth and the, uh, you know, the people groups of the earth, and we can say, no, there's, there's uh, thousands of, uh, of kingdoms of the earth. No, there really is. A, there's only two. Uh, there's the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. But through this trumpet and the announcement of this woe, Satan's kingdom will be totally destroyed and the world will come under the rulership of the lordship of jesus christ and there'll be one established kingdom on earth it says the kingdom's world has become now that's in the aorist tense and it means to come and to be and to become it is literally actively now having come into being looks forward to an event of the seventh trumpet, namely the establishment of God's kingdom here on earth. That's what we're looking at. We're looking out forward in this chronological view of the tribulation. At this point, the seventh bowl judgments have, uh, have yet to be poured out, but they make up the seventh trumpet and will now fall in rapid succession. That they make up the seventh trumpet is clear from the fact that it's the last trumpet and establishes the rule of Christ. He says, our, of our Lord and our Christ. This, this, the kingdom of the earth have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The word there, of course, is the word kyrios. And here it's used for, Je for Jehovah of the Old Testament. It refers to God the Father. And of his Christ, it says, of the Lord and of his Christ, refers to the Messiah of the Old Testament. That promise, that expectation who God uh, would, uh, would send and has sent into the world. And he, it says, will reign forever. Now, this is speaking of the millennial reign of Christ that will last only a thousand years, but it pushes forward from that to the reign of Christ that will continue throughout all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. So here we have the fulfillment of, of many of the Old Testament prophecies that look forward to the eternal rule of God when God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many of us have prayed that over the years? as we mimic or pray through or think through the, the Lord's Prayer, and we include that in our daily prayer or in our prayers from time to time, that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, I will tell you, at this point in time, at the end of the tribulation, that's exactly what you and I are going to see. That prayer perfectly, absolutely, 
uh, uh, brought to perfection. Daniel emphasizes the eternal kingdom five times in his prophecy. The first being in Daniel 2 and uh, verses 34 uh, to 35 and again in uh, there we go. He says uh, in, in verse 45, 44, he says, you continue looking until a stone is cut out from, remember, we're looking at the vision of Nebuchadnezzar's vision of that uh, uh, that giant statue with the uh, the gold headed on down to the feet and ankles that are mixed with bronze and uh, or uh, iron and, and clay. He says, you continued looking until a stone was cut without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron and clay and bronze and silver and gold were crushed all at the same time. It came like chaff from the summer threshing floor. That's all the nations of the world just being blown away like chaff on a summer's threshing floor. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them would be found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. We're talking now about the kingdom of God filling the entire earth. Verse 44. Uh, in the, verse 44, there we go. In the, and, and in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never, underline never, be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush and put an end to these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever and ever. Remember when we were in Daniel, we talked about that. I, I lifted that up and I said, we'll get to that later. We're here. Because this is the, the this is the the talking of the end of the tribulation, the destruction of, of the kingdoms of this world, and the establishment of the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ, and who will reign forever and ever. But we can fast forward. We can go up to chapter six after Daniel's rescued from the lion's den, and then in chapter seven, when uh, Daniel sees the ancient of days, both of these places re uh, uh, refer to this everlasting and eternal kingdom. But in Daniel 7, uh, really, really looking at, at very much at the day in which we're looking at in Revelation. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the people, nations, men, in every language might serve him. His dominion is everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. Underline that. Will not pass away. And his kingdom is is one which will not, underline that, be destroyed. So if you've got your markers in Daniel where you, you know, and in, in Zechariah and Jeremiah, other places that you've put markers, just flip over there to Daniel and, and reference now uh, these verses in Revelation chapter uh, 11. Uh, verses uh, 15 through 19, reference those to these two places that I've just given you in Daniel. Zechariah also informs us, so you do the same thing here. In Zechariah 14 and verse 9, he says, And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. You see, we're referencing now those exact events prophesied through Daniel or Zechariah, Ezekiel. We could go there, but I, you know, due to time, uh, you know, I'm only giving you some of the references. You can do a little homework and find the rest of them and refer them back to this passage we're looking at in Revelation and chapter 11. These, are, of course, they're only a sampling, a sampling of multiple references to the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth, both in the old and the new. Now, we move, you know, in the sequential order here, the adoration of the Lord, uh, uh, you know, God, the actions of uh, 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 the adoration, uh, there we go, true worship results in, in action befitting the attitude of the heart. Here's a lesson for us. You can pluck this out. Put it right here on this 29th day of November, and it applies to you and to me. Here we have the 24 elders, which is representative of the church age. Uh, those saints who come out of the church age, who have already received their crown, cast them before God. Now recognize that it is 
it is time or soon will be for the reward of the Old Testament and the tribulation saints. The coming of the kingdom will be connected with the giving uh, uh, of rewards to the faithful servants of God, which Jesus so beautifully portrays in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and uh, uh, verse 42 all the way through chapter 25, verse 30. In recognition of God's faithfulness to his people and to the sovereign actions of God, the 24 elders rise from their throne wherein they're reigning with Christ and they fall on their faces in humble adoration to Almighty God. And while they reign with him, they recognize that this is all because of who and what God is and what he's accomplished through the Messiah to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then comes the shouts of adoration. Oh, people, we ought to live with, 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 with shouts of adoration upon our lips, filling our heart and flowing over in our lives. That's the lesson for our day. Revelation chapter 11 and verses 17. There we go. Acting slow today. 17 through 18. He says, we give thanks, O Lord, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints, Old Testament, those who fear your name, small and great, and destroy those who destroy the earth. There are five things within these verses of thanksgiving that we see. Two are inscriptions of praise to God regarding his person, and three are assignments to which God has committed himself. Let's take a minute and look at those. I'll give them to you. Write them down. The first is continual thanks for the person of God, for who he is. He is the Almighty, possessor of all power and rule. It speaks of God's sovereignty, does it not? The omnipotence of, uh, as, as supreme ruler over the universe. And next, God is praised for his, e, uh, e, for his eternity, for you know, his everlastingness, for the fact that uh, he has no beginning and no ending. And you'll notice that who is to come is left out of that. I, I don't know whether you notice that or not. I tried to highlight it as I read it. I'll go back and share it with you again in verse 17. We give thanks, O Lord our God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you've taken your great power and begun to reign. But it doesn't say, and who is to come. Remember, in usually what we see is he who was, who is, who, who was, who is, and is to come. That's usually the reference that are tied here. But that's not what we have here. Who is to come is left out. You know why? Have you figured it out yet? Because John is looking forward to that point in history whereby God has come. You see, there's no more intent to say who is to come because it, what we're looking at as he's in this helicopter view, he's looking out to the end at the, at the reign of Christ at the end of the tribulation. He's saying he has already come. So there's no reason to say uh, who will, uh, who is to come. Now, the second thing that you see there is thanks is given be, at this point in history because God will be exercising his complete sovereignty. The elders are saying, because you have taken your great power. In his immutability, God has always possessed omnipotence. He's always been in control. He's always been in power, but he has not always exercised his absolute authority or power over the earth. But here at this point, he takes hold of it in the sense that he begins to accept, uh, exercise it absolutely. And this stresses that once God acts in this way, it will be a permanent establishment. and The world will have begin to experience its results. At this point, in our life, in our time, Satan has uh, uh, a license. God has... And <coughs> <clears throat> allowed him <clears throat> certain liberties and certain license so God is not absolutely exercising absolute authority in every action on earth. But the day will come 
that that will change. So that's what this praise is about. Third thing that we see in this praise of adoration is thanks is given because God now, uh, now, now God truly, through the exercise of his power, has begun to reign. The tribulation judgments as shown previously in chapter 5 represent the first steps of God beginning to take the reins of government. This is especially true at this point in the tribulation because the return of Christ is now so very near. Now, fourth, thanks is put on display for thanks for the display of, of God's wrath. Now that's a little tough for us to, to swallow. Because we don't like to think about the wrath of God, but the wrath of God is going to be here. Here we have the fulfillment of the passage that we read in Psalm 2. Remember last week we looked at Psalm 2. If you don't remember it, write that down in the margin of your notes or something and to go back and reread that. Why do the nations rage? Why do they come against and so on and so forth? And now God laughs at them in derision and, and brings judgment. Just before the return of Christ, as part of the sixth bowl, the armies of this world will be gathered together in a place which the Hebrews call Armageddon or the Valley of Destruction. We'll get to that in chapter 16. You can read about it also in Joel 3. At this point, as never before, the nations are enraged against one another and against God. But their wrath is impotent against the omnipotence of the holy wrath of God. So John adds in this, and your wrath came. In this context, especially, it refers to the final phase of the tribulation, the seventh trumpet, the seventh bowl of judgment, uh, seven bowl judgments that are concluded by the personal return of Jesus. God's wrath, when it comes, will overcome the rage of men, and it'll bring doom and judgment and the end of rebellion, which brings us to the fifth thing in this in this uh, this cry of, 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 of adoration. Thanks is given for the judgment and the reward of Old Testament saints, including these tribulation saints. And it says the time came for the dead to be judged. This refers to the resurrection, judgment, and reward of Old Testament saints at the end of the tribulation of Daniel's 70 week just prior to the millennium. Remember Daniel says some will be raised, uh, well, this includes those tribulation saints as well because they're part of Daniel's 70th week. It concludes God's program for Israel in the millennium. This whole scene is precisely what Daniel is speaking about in Daniel 12. Flip over there. Just go there. You'll find it also in Revelation 20. But in Daniel 12, 1 through 3, remember these words? Now that the there we go. Now that the, the now now at that time Michael the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise and there will be a time of distress such as never uh, occurred since the nation until that time. And at that time your people everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. Many okay, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of the heaven. Those who uh, lead many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. So some are going to be raised to dishonor and, dis and disgrace. That's the great white throne judgment and others. Uh, and they'll be raised to everlasting contempt, but others will be raised for uh, 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 to become you know, rewarded. They're, they're going to be like the brightness of the expanse of the heaven and uh, stars who shine forever and ever. The Old Testament and the tribulation saints risen are rewarded. Unbelievers await the great white throne judgment. And remember now, the church is already in heaven. We've already been resurrected. We've been raptured. We're already in heaven and received our rewards already. So, uh, uh, this is, again, another place where I think people have problems with the book because, well, how many resurrections are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the resurrection of the saints prior to the tribulation, 
we're talking about the resurrection of the Old Testament uh, saints and uh, tribulation saints. We're talking about the resurrection of the dead who will be resurrected to judgment. So there's basically three different resurrections that we're talking about here. Not just one. One prior to, one for the saints toward the end, and one for the wicked later on. This God's wrath is aimed at the enraged nations. It takes up the last part of verse 18 with the words to destroy those who destroy the earth. This refers to the final judgments that are aimed at those living on the earth. These will either be killed outright or they'll be removed by Christ at the judgment uh, you know, at, at the judgments of the Jews and the Gentiles that will occur at the end of the tribulation. Now, we move from there into uh, a, a scene in heaven. We, we find that we're, we're now going you know, to look up into heaven at this marvelous scene at the ark in the temple in heaven. What a scene that will be. In verse 19, And the temple of God which is in heaven was opened. And the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. Now I should note uh, that this chapter began with an apostate temple, remember, on earth, the measuring of the apostate temple, but it closes triumphantly with the heavenly temple in view for, for, for men to see. Again, it stresses, as in Isaiah 6, the awesome holiness of God and the basic cause of God's wrath. Remember, this earthly apostate temple is desecrated by the beast, but he cannot touch the heavenly temple, which reflects God's perfect righteousness, perfect judgment, and perfect majesty. You see, that's what's happening on your earth now, is God is exacting perfect righteousness, perfect judgment, and perfect majesty. These things, the things seen in the temple are symbolic of the presence of God by the Shekinah glory which hovers over the mercy seat, by the faithfulness of God is emphasized by the contents of the ark, which is the law which guided God's people, Aaron's rod that budded, uh, which is a picture of the resurrection, the pot of manna, which is a picture of, 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 of the person of Christ and his daily provision. God's divine holiness, which could not be approached without blood, which spoke of the sacrifice of Christ. All this is seen in heaven. It's there to remind the Jews that God is going to fulfill his covenant promises to them. It is an encouragement of faith toward Christ. Accompanying the sight of the ark is the uh, lightning and peals of thunder, an earthquake and a great hailstorm, all of which are signs of doom and judgment. God, in his absolute holiness, must deal with sin and the rebellion of man. But before this judgment is poured out in the seven bowls of wrath, the chronological sequence is again interrupted to portray other events and situations which will be in existence during the last half of the tribulation. This will serve to highlight the dramatic return of Christ as he comes back in the midst of such horrific conditions. And this is the longest parenthetical portion that we're going to look at and study. Apart from the outpourings of the bowls, which occur in rapid succession, there is a little chronological, little chronological movement from this point until we get to chapter 19. So from 12 until we get into chapter 19, we're going to be looking at events that are going to be going on, but then everything's going to come to a very rapid conclusion. Events and situations are now introduced which are concurrent with the seals and the trumpets which serve to emphasize the dramatic climax of this period in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand what we're going to be looking at now? We're going to be going in when we get into chapter 12 until we get to chapter 19 when it, when it gets poured out. We're going to be looking at various scenes, things that will be happening during the seals and, 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 the, and the trumpets and, and ultimately the pouring out of the bowls of wrath. Okay. I hope that that gives you 
a working understanding of how we're, that's one of the reasons this book is difficult to read and get through and understand is because of the way it moves, you know, through the story, how you'll be going in a timeline at one point, and then you stop and you bounce around looking at scenes and then you're back into the movement of the story and it stops. Now we're down to the next parenthetical section of Revelation. Questions? Throw them at me. I'll try and get you answers. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that uh, this book is overwhelming. Because, Lord, we're seeing things of you that, uh, that have been hidden in shadows through the other 65 books that now come out in, in brilliant colors. And, Lord, we confess that we are finite and you are infinite. And it's difficult for us to get our minds and heads around something so beyond our understanding. I can well imagine how overwhelmed John must have felt seeing all of this and be given the task to write it all down, to be given to us. And how incredible it must have been for the churches in the first, second, third, fourth, up through the history of man to, to try and ferret out the truths of this word. We have the privilege of looking at some things in, in greater hindsight than they did. But still, we look at these upcoming events and we're mystified by them. So Lord, just simply help us see the splendor, the wonder of our God in the midst of all of this. You, O oh Lord, are glorious. Glorious beyond measure. May we serve you, Lord, with all of our heart. May you be blessed by every thought and action of our life. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that the joy of the Lord will be just multiplied in you a thousandfold today as you serve him, as you as you obey him, as you walk in, in the light of his love. May God bless you. We're going to pick this up starting in chapter 12 tomorrow and moving forward. Nine o'clock. We'll see you then. God bless. Pray for Michaela and Sean. They're going to be packing up today and heading up toward uh, Puyallup. And he has to check in at the base on Wednesday. So uh, be in prayer for all of them as they're going to be back on the road, even a short trip. So uh, God bless you. We'll see you in the morning.